there are a number of electric electricity systems in North America that are adopting battery storage in a big way. Uh, California would be one of them. And so that leads to all kinds of questions about what kind of battery storage and how much of it can be made available in a reasonable amount of time. So we're going to talk to Kai Philipp uh, Kerries of Akura Battery Systems in Germany about this issue. So welcome to the interview, Kai. Hey, Marco. So let's start with an overview of battery storage and utility scale power systems. Um, how, you know, can you give us an overview, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so the whole area of grid connected battery systems has become really big over the past decade. So in the early 2010, 11, 12, it really started to kick off with utility scale storage systems exceeding a megawatt hour or maybe five megawatt hours for ancillary services in countries around the world and also residential home storage systems that store you know locally produced solar energy for the night and both of these fields have since then doubled in size every 12 to 18 months Okay, and so lithium ion is, uh, is still the, the leading technology. Uh, are we gonna be able to make enough lithium ion batteries to satisfy utility scale requirements? Um, actually, the, the question of requirements is very interesting and very controversial because some people say we need lots of battery storage to enable high shares of renewable energies in our grids. Whereas other people believe that power grids are an equally efficient way of dealing with this. And I personally believe the truth will be somewhere in the middle. We will need storage in our systems to allow for high shares. Um, in terms of the amounts that we need, it's relatively small compared to the amounts of lithium ion we will need for the mobility sector. So I don't believe that stationary batteries will be uh, the, the bottleneck for lithium ion production. Now, what about um, other kinds of technologies like flow batteries, for instance? Because uh, I understand that the lithium ion is a fairly short duration, maybe four hours, and uh, you know, power grids need longer duration storage. Will that come from like a flow battery or some other technology? Well, the general idea behind, um, you know, <laughs> Putting a time label on the battery means at which cost can I store energy? Because the higher the cost is, the lower the amount of hours is that I can store it because I need to use it multiple times in a day to get you know, my CapEx back from the revenues I make by storing energy. So in order to store energy economically for a long time, it needs to be very cheap. Um, and so if we talk about eight hour, 12 hour storage and people say we need to move to other technologies like flow batteries, that implies that the cost for a stored kilowatt hour of energy in the flow battery needs to be half or 25% of that of lithium ion battery. And in reality, we haven't really got there. So if you look at flow batteries today, that vanadium flow batteries, for example, they're usually more expensive than lithium ion batteries. So they would be even, you know, for a four hour system, they would be more expensive. And for an eight or 12 hour system, they would be even more expensive. But the long-term vision is to find um, material combinations that in a flow battery can go as low as $10 per kilowatt hour maybe. So are there any other uh, technologies, uh, battery technologies that we should be keeping an eye on for storage at utility scale? But one interesting one that has been around for a long time, actually much longer than uh, lithium ion batteries is sodium sulfur batteries, uh, so-called high temperature batteries because they only operate above an operating temperature of about 300, 350 degrees centigrade. Um, it was developed and commercialized by the Japanese company NGK, um, which people know from, from their cars because they have the, um, the ignition bulbs for, for the engine. Um, and they've been operating this technology since late 70s, early 80s in Japan. Um, the 
the great thing about this technology, it uses abundantly available resources. Sodium and sulfur are both not, you know, not sparse. Um, but it comes with a couple of challenges. Uh, it is a very low power technology. So the maximum speed of charge is within six hours and it's not faster because of the very slow kinematics. And the same goes for discharging. The efficiency is relatively low, much lower than lithium ion. And it's only one company on the world that actually commercializes this technology. So without competition in the market, it, it, it's hard for companies to commit to just one supplier and then basically be relying on this just one source. Right. Now, I, I was interested in your comment earlier about, you know, there's a, a camp of analysts who think that, you know, the, the grid will be able to do a lot of the basically managing the grid through demand response, maybe integrating uh, two way bi directional uh, integration of electric vehicles uh, into the grid. So is that kind of the direction that the battery industry is going? They're not thinking that they have to make huge amounts, you know, increase of batteries for for utility scale, but there's all sorts of clever uh, other clever solutions that will make the best use of the batteries that are integrated into the grid. Is that the direction the industry is going? That's a good question because like from a system perspective, there's a lot of synergies we could use from electric cars, from demand response, and you know, virtual transmission is a thing where you basically can increase the um, capabilities of a transmission line um, to the max and utilizing a buffer that's usually always there by having uh, energy storage on both sides. And these are all like super interesting things from a technical perspective, but all the companies and all the, the whole industries are basically operating on a microeconomic scope. So they will do whatever benefits their business. And so we need a system perspective from legislation that incentivizes smart usage of storage, for example. And while you know, in, in research circles, people have been talking about this for about 10 years and it's quite clear that there are some no regret solutions that will definitely improve things and, you know, that's a good way to go anyway, and we can discuss some details later. But, you know, legislators have been quite slow. And for example, in Germany, uh, where I've been doing a couple of studies on this uh, issue is, we still haven't legally defined what a storage system is. <laughs> like, that's where we are right now. And thinking about how to integrate it into all these different industries is probably a couple of years out, unfortunately. Well, that, that leads to an interesting question. And I know we spend a lot of time talking about the energy transition and we're talking about the shift to renewables and so on. We focus on the technology, but I'm having more and more experts like yourself say, you know what, uh, the policy framework and regulation can be a, is a just, well, maybe not as important, but it's very, very important to oh, make, yeah. you know, good use of that technology, make the whole system work. It, and are we seeing that? As we, uh, you mentioned Germany, I'm sure we're seeing it in North America as well. Absolutely. Uh, to be honest, I, I, I would go so far to say we could stop researching technology where we are today and still would be able to come up with a pretty good system if we could you know, get all the legislation and all the system levels right. Of course, you know, technology is always developing further and that's great it's making things easier but it's not the roadblock we're not waiting for a technological revolution we're just waiting for the system to to find together in a meaningful way now that you know the era of fossil fuels comes to an end yeah and i think um that uh, perhaps many of our viewers won't I realize, and I'm not sure that I even understand it all that well, but the complexity of these systems and, and how difficult it is to make changes and still maintain yeah. low cost reliability and so on. Yeah. The, uh, I've, I've heard the power grids described as uh, humanity, the, the biggest 
uh, machine that humanity has ever made. And, you know, so it, it, it's not an easy task, I guess. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's technically complex. And another thing that we should keep in mind is, you know, the people and organizations that um, appear to be slowing down this necessary transition to renewable energies, you know, they're not against renewable energies usually. Like these are people and organizations whose main focus is to keep the system running, you know, with the highest degree of security that's, that's possible. And every change has a risk, right? And so the people that we, that we pay to, to, to keep our system safe, of course, they're going to have, you know, thoughts about every single step that we implement. So it's totally understandable. But I believe that, you know, as a society, we should not put these discussions that we need about in which kind of world do we want to live. It's not going to be solved by an expert group deciding on a standard for, you know, the transmission capability of a cable. We need to, as a society, find a consensus on what we want and give all the people, you know, that care about the details a goal. You know, and, and I believe that once we have, and we're in the process of doing that, but it's still ongoing. And I believe that once we have agreed on where we want to go, things might be a little bit faster down the line, but it's, it's a huge project. Well, then we'll see what role batteries play in the, yeah. the evolution of that, uh, of that process. Kai, uh, appreciate your insights as always. Thank you very much. Thank you.